documents and particularly if there are frequently asked questions I will address them but the detailed feedback will be from uh, your design pod partners. Thank you. Other questions? All right speaking of lab two it's now posted there are uh, changes to pull from upstream uh, this will be our first lab with uh, a design component, so by Thursday 9 p.m. you should, uh, each uh, group uh, uh, needs to put a design document for lab two on the design pod channel to which you've been added on the course Slack. And uh, these will be graded for completion. So. Uh, they won't be graded based on the specifics of your design, but whether you have produced a uh, reasonable design document. And one way to view this design process uh, is as a way to generate all your questions about the lab before you start coding. The idea is that you think through carefully all the steps you're going to need to do, the different data structures involved, which files you might need to change and where. And by going through this before you start coding, there will probably be lots of questions. Those can go into the design document. You don't need to have all the answers as part of the design. Identifying what you don't know, crucial part of designing a complex piece of software. And so on, uh, to help us get started with this design aspect, and also because I expect this lab two will be one of the more challenging labs in the course, on when part of class Wednesday, we'll have do some brainstorming as a class about uh, some of the design issues in lab two. And Friday, we will not meet here. We will meet in the large lab, Olin 310, and we will have uh, a work day on lab two. So uh, we'll spend class uh, uh, working on lab two on Friday. Any questions on that? All right. Let's do some practice with uh, understanding uh, fork and wait and exit. This first one, I have some C code there, and I'd like you to think through when this code, uh, when we've finished executing the main method before it the whole process terminates. Uh, how many copies of X will there be? And what values will those have?
All right, let's do our best guesses. Uh, I think you're covering up just a little. There we go. All right. All right, we're uh, definitely means there are going to be multiple copies, but a little bit of disagreement about what the values would be. Please uh, discuss with your neighbors how you worked through uh, what was going on with X. Zero means that you No, zero is the child. Like, the parent the child. So, like, do stuff with that. Yeah, return zero for the child. All right, sounds like we're ready for round two. Change your answer. All right. So I think in this case it will be D. We start out in a world of a single process where X is 5. What happens when that first fork call? As a result of the first fork call, how might I change this picture? Oh. I mean, the um, parents, like so the parent child split, and the child goes into the fifth clause of it. The child goes into the plus five part. Exactly. So, fork's going to create a child process that's identical to the parent. So, x is going to be five. Uh, and, key difference is. There's a single variable that's different between the child and the parent. Which one is that? The ID. Child. Yeah, the return value of fork. Um, so in our parent, child is some process ID. It's going to be some positive integer, maybe one, two, three. And in this one, child is zero. So we can see that they're going to do they're going to take different branches of our if-else. So our uh, child adds 5 to x and then doesn't do anything else. Our parent goes into the else and calls fork again. So we have this same process uh, or, or yeah, same effect where we now have another child with x of 5 where child is zero, and the previous value of child has been replaced by whatever the second fork returned, one, two, four, maybe. And now both the ch parent and the child resume execution at the same point after fork returns. And so that's how we get. both adding 10, and then if child, meaning 
if the variable child is not zero, which will be just in the parent, we add another five. Does that make sense? What are your questions on that? So when, uh, that's a good question, when, when we fork, we copy the parent's entire memory into the child. We create a new process that's a complete clone of the parent, with the only exception being what the return value of fork is. It's the only difference. So when we fork, if there's a variable uh, x that's defined on the next line, both the parent and child are going to define that variable. So then they'll proceed to go in different directions. Okay. I was just wondering if that x had to be yeah, so uh, I did do this in a bit, uh, the initial fork in a bit of the wrong order. Because when we initially uh, have that initial fork, we haven't defined any variables. But both processes are at at the first line of main, and then they both will do x equals 5 as they execute independently after fork returns. So, uh, they're both going to end up with x equals 5 so long as uh, that statement is not, say, inside something, an if statement that depends on the value of child. Because that is the only difference between them. They'll execute identically other than things that depend on that value. So then, my follow-up question is because you say that they're executing independently, that's how they are both able to. Yes, these uh, boxes that I am drawing on the board uh, to represent the processes, they are completely isolated from one another. They have their own memory, uh, and the operating system, they, they could be running at the same time, the operating system would be switching between them, uh, but they have their own memory, their own stack, their own instruction pointer. Uh, so we've made, uh, once, once we copy over the things from the parent, they're no longer connected, uh, except for that the parent can wait for its child to finish. The wait system call is specifically where a parent process can coordinate with its children just by waiting to, for them to finish. Sean? So if, like the first if statement was instead if child, and that's it, then the parent process would enter the else state. You're saying, what if we change this to if child rather than if child equals zero? That would just swap. If this was if child, the parent would do this branch, and the child would do this branch. Oh, so then for the second fork, where would the children start running? Would it start running at line one or around like x plus ten? So it's a good question. Where do the children start running? Uh, when we do this copying process, we copy over the instruction pointer. We copy over the information about which instruction is going to be executed next. So the parent and child will uh, both start running at the point where fork returns. Because that's the next thing that will happen in the parent, and thus, when we copy the parent, the next thing that happens in the child. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. 
Do they just copy the instruction point, or does it copy like the whole like region of memory storing like the code being executed? Uh, that's a fair question. Uh, we definitely need to copy the instruction pointer because each sort of process has its uh, CPU context, which includes the information you need to run that process, like the instruction pointer. Uh, conceptually, we can think of the code as being copied. But since the code is a read-only region of memory, we might be able to optimize and not actually copy it because we can't ever change it. But certainly, they'll each have their own sort of virtual, a virtual address for the code, but it just might go to the same physical memory. Other questions? All right, let's take a look at a program that does some printing. And I'd like you to think about what the output of this program will be. Uh, that this uh, an assignment statement can be an expression uh, in C and, and uh, I think in Java as well. And the value of it is whatever value is being assigned. So this if both assigns the return value of fork to PID and also uses that value as true or false. All right, give me your best guess on this one. All right, looks like there's uh, some uh, good things to discuss. Uh, again, talk with your neighbors about how you're thinking about what will execute when, what variables will have what values. But I was looking at yeah. 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 Yeah.
And that continues from there. So, I, thought, I thought the child was as high as the All right, let's do round two. If uh, you've changed your mind. Just thinking since they're accessing the same variable now. Oh, it's the kind of copy from the will copy from the All right, lots of movement toward A. That's excellent. I believe that's what this code uh, will do. Uh, someone who uh, who changed your answer I'd like to uh, share kind of what it what it was that changed how you were thinking about this. Victoria. Um, yeah. So I changed my mind because I was thinking about the different Exactly. Parent and child have totally separate copies of this variable vowel. Uh, the same thing. Sorry, I had a quick question. Um, I remember in 208 we had sort of similar problems and uh, we were trying to describe the uh, issue of the race condition. Um, I was wondering sort of why, maybe it was a different problem, but why there was race conditions and different variables then and not now. Yes, that's an uh, 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 excellent point. When we have, when we're dealing with multiple, when we're dealing with multiprocessing, in the sense that we have multiple processes, by default, there are ways that you can set this up differently, but by default there's no shared memory between the multiple processes, so we cannot have two processes sort of racing to see who gets to modify some shared data first because they have no shared memory. And as we'll talk about next week, uh, well starting today and continuing uh, through Next week, when we have multi-threading, that's multiple threads within a single process, so they are all sharing. Sharing memory, and so if two threads are updating the same variable, then they may interfere with each other. David. So like, so if there's a val like the event week, if I just like val plus plus, then the val variable in both the chai and, and, and the parent Implemented right without the weight. So because we call weight, then it's only come back to parent branch and only the like refer back to the old memory. So uh, the all that this call to weight is doing here is ensuring that the child prints out before the parent. It doesn't have any other uh, uh, like because the the parent forks and then the parent waits for the child to finish. So, uh, if, as an OSV, uh, print is not guaranteed to be atomic, where uh, when we call printf, it's not guaranteed that we get the whole string at once if there's some other process that's also printing. So, without this weight, you could get something like 6, 6, New line, new line. If, if the operating system was switching between these two processes in the middle of their prints, which it's allowed to do, you could get the different characters mixed together. 
But this wait says, okay, the parent's going to wait for the child to print six new line first, and then it will continue on. Well, in the last example, like for example, let's say x um, plus equal ten, and then both like the child and the parent both change the value. Mm -hmm. So like, what's the difference in this like that? It's like we say val plus plus. So I was thinking like, um, wouldn't that also change like the parent variable, the parent memory, like the last example? Uh, yes, and it did change the parent's memory. Both the parent and the child had val equal five, and they both add one to it and print out six. That, are you saying why doesn't the child doing it change the parent's variable? Right, so it's, um, right, and then after, so after the child returns, then the parent comes back to what line? Will it come back to like that plus plus again, or just? Uh, when the child terminates, mm -hmm. only then will the function wait return. Like when the parent calls wait, it just stops, it blocks until the child is waiting on terminate. So only once the child finishes its whole function and its process is done, then the wait function returns and the parent continues to back. Right, so why doesn't like file plus plus again? The parent after it turns out to be. Well, I guess the picture is we have the child with PID zero. The parent with PID 1, 2, 3, the parent waits, the child adds 1 to val, 6, prints that out, then the child terminates, now the parent resumes, the parent adds 1 to val, and prints out 6. So, I guess, I, I guess I'm not sure, you mean, you're asking me, like, does val++ plus plus change the parent's memory. I mean, it does get to that line, and it does add one to val. Right, well, then the child first increment, it doesn't also increment the parent. Yeah, because there's no shared memory. The parent and child are completely separate from each other. Their variables are in entirely different places in memory. So when the child adds one to its val, that's not the same, uh, that's not the same variable that the parent has. They're separate copies of each other. Other questions? So the, if you're storing a pointer to some value, then that would be unit at seven. Uh, if and we have val as a pointer to five, and now the pointer to five, well, this, these fives are also part of the process's memory, and so they are also copied. And so even with pointers, this memory isn't, you, processes are not allowed to have a pointer and to access memory that belongs to some other process. If they do that, the operating system shuts them down. Because the idea is, if one process could go and even read memory of another process, now the spyware app can just read all data from all running processes on your machine. And that would be very bad. So the operating system is going to isolate processes from each other. They can't touch each other's memory at all. All right. So. Let's tweak this code a little bit and involve a call to exit the uh, call to wait here. Uh, can in the previous example it passed it null, which is its way of saying I don't care what the exit status uh, of the child was, but if wait passes in a pointer, then once the child exits and wait returns, wait will have updated the value that it points to with whatever the child exited with.
And uh, the exit function terminates the currently running process, whatever process calls it. Whatever integer that you pass in to exit is that process's exit status, which the wait system call can retrieve by passing in a pointer and say, okay, whatever status the child exited with, put it in this pointer. All right, let's do round one, and then we'll have a chance for discussion. All right, some votes for all the possibilities. Please discuss with your neighbors how you're thinking about how the child and parent will interact in this Wait past then a point to the value. Right. And exit returns six. Oh, or exit was called with a value of six. I see. So it's going to edit that pointer to point to a value of six. So the parent's value will then be six. And then it gets incremented by one. I think this is like the one time when a child is allowed to appear, when processes are allowed to interact, is with the wait function. Because it's not arbitrary. It has to happen when one of the processes ends, and it's kind of controlled by the parent process. So they can be sure that like the child process can't just like arbitrarily edit whatever they want. They can only just like pass this one specific value back to the parent. But passing, I feel like they'd be passing different values. I thought the, yeah, I thought it'd be different. The whole they do have different versions shared. of it. They do have different versions of it, right? But the child isn't passing, it isn't directly updating value, it's just passing back the number of six. Nothing else. It's just passing back the number of six. It's just saying the exit status is six, and then the parents putting that six into its value. Alright, I'm kind of, I appreciate you explaining this to me, thank you. Alright, round two, if your thinking has changed. I have to keep it simple. I really appreciate your time. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're indeed going to print just one thing. Uh, in this case, it will be seven. And I heard some good discussion about. If it's seven, that means the child is somehow affecting the parent's memory. And one thing to keep in mind is this wait and exit. These are system calls, which means that they're turn they're both of these are turning control over to the kernel. So when the parent says wait. That turns control over to the kernel, and now this process is just sitting here waiting for the child to terminate. When the child says exit six, that also goes into the kernel. And because we're in the kernel, we're allowed the kernel can modify the memory of whatever processes it wants. Or 
in this case, kernel data structures like the process control block, which might be keeping track of the exit status. So this says exit 6. All right, we have uh, this child marked as exit status 6. Then this wait can, in the system call, change the pointer that it was passed in to be 6. So before, we had val. It points to 5, and then inside the kernel, it copies whatever the status that the child exited with, it, with into this location in memory, which the parent passed in. And so then when wait returns to the parent, and it, continue, and it continues after the else, Val has been changed to be six. Wait for it. So how is the exit status connected to a variable Val? Like for example, what if multiple variables were declared, like if there's Val, Val one, Val two, like how would that how would that change? Uh, so in this case the it uh, Val is only relevant to the exit status in that it is involved in getting the number six. Like instead of exit of val plus one, the child had done exit of six without any mention of val at all, the effect would be the same. Uh, so that exit is not setting up some relation between val and the child and val and the parent, it's just passing a number to the kernel, and the kernel fills that in using the pointer that the parent passed in via weight. David. So, um... So, like, so the child points to the kernel to exit, so the child also does not, like, execute, like, val plus plus? Correct. The, the exit system call just terminates the process. So exit never returns to the process they call it, because the process just stops running as a result of calling exit. Right, correct. So what if there were multiple variables associated with the parent process, and you still have a six, which variable would it change the parent, uh, the variable that this changed is whatever memory location this pointer has to wait points to. So in this case, it's a pointer to this variable val. But whatever lo address that pointed to, that would be the address that got six. Yeah. And so with the exit for the kernel status and zero, the successful one, whatever, whatever, that's usually when we don't have something. Uh, so, this is a kind of tiny example that can fit here, but the reason why the parent might want to retrieve the status like this is, uh, imagine a, uh, like a web server that when it gets a request to return some web page, it uses fork to create another process that's going to go do whatever work it needs to get that web page. And it's going to wait for that to, to finish. Uh, and if that fork process is going to get that web page fails for some reason, hopefully it, it will exit with a non-zero status. And the parent could check on that and then just try it again or take or return some error to the user or something uh, based on whether the child was successful or whether it encountered some kind of error. Um, so, as we saw in the previous example, you can also just wait for a child because you want to make sure the child goes first before the parent resumes, and in that case, maybe you don't care about the exit status, and so you just have no. Jimmy. Okay, so like, how, how does the, um, the, end, the, end, the end sign that the connects with the value in name? Like, are, are they referring to the same variable? Uh, the ampersand is the address of operator in C, which means that ampersand val means give me the address in memory of this variable. And so it's a way of, in basically val is an int, ampersand val is an 
in star. It's a pointer to an integer because it's the memory address of an integer. So they are absolutely connected because this is a pointer to val. Does that make sense? So it's a child a zombie since it's terminated, but we're still using its data. Exactly. The once the child calls exit, the operating system can't just totally deallocate uh, everything about it because we need to keep that exit status around because its parent might want to use it later. So, yeah, the child once it calls exit would be in the zombie state, and then once the parent waited on it then we can just throw away everything associated with that process because the parent can wait on a child at most once and then it's done. But can you just have two functions that each wait on each other and will that just like permanently just use up space in your computer? So wait is specifically a parent waiting for a child. Uh, but if you just call, if you called fork and then instead of having an if before it, you just had them both call wait on so if, if, uh, uh, if you look at the wait system call, it will return an error if you have no child that you can currently wait on. Gotcha. So if the child calls wait, it hasn't created any children, it's not going to get blocked. Wait a second, so parent, parents have some reference to their child, right? Uh, that's an implementation detail. Okay. So uh, parents might keep some uh, uh, record of all their children, or there might be some kind of global uh, list of all processes, and parents can find their children in that. Gotcha. Um, there's different ways that you can do it. Huh. All right, so these are uh, the, the sort of, kind of questions and, and, and different types of scenarios that uh, we'll need to be thinking through uh, a lab two, but let's uh, talk uh, about uh, kind of last piece of processes. And that is, we've talked about how processes, uh, we don't need two uh, We've talked about how processes are isolated from one another, one another uh, which is great, provides all sorts of useful protection. But there are situations where we might want processes to be able to coordinate or collaborate in some way. And so we might, we will want some way for them to communicate with. Uh, with each other. And there are different strategies that we might use uh, to do this. Anyone have an idea for some way one process might get information to another? No? Yeah, so we saw with, with uh, wait uh, and exit, for example, there's like a specific way to communicate a single integer kind of between the two. Um, and there may be other system calls, uh, or you could design other system calls that might facilitate that. Um, but uh, if we want to be able to send, say, arbitrary bytes between two processes, uh, uh, just wait and exit might, might not do the trick. Jimmy? Can you say the memory of separate? Yes, we absolutely could use some file on disk where one process is writing to the file and another process is reading from it, and then we're just using the file system to send arbitrary bytes from one process to another. Uh, any downside to using files, Aiden? It's slow. It's very slow. Uh, maybe the operating system could do some clever optimization and keep the contents of these files in kernel memory somewhere, 
And so it's not actually writing out to disk very often, but yes, we certainly have to be aware that if this data is actually being sent round trip from disk, that's going to be very slow. So we probably want some other some other way of doing this. Very short. Yeah, so if we could set up some sort of uh, shared memory, that might be ideal because that avoids this sort of round trip to disk. So one uh, common way to do this on Unix is with something called a pipe, which uh, we can think of there's some process That is, a, that is producing the data, and it sends it into a pipe, which is really just an array or buffer that is maintained by the kernel. And then we have some other process, which, which we might call the consumer, that is reading whatever this other process is writing to this array, to this pipe. And uh, the kind of optimization here, as compared to files, is that this array is in memory versus potentially far away on the disk. In order to set something up, set, set something up like this, uh, you typically uh, uh, are only going to be able to do it for processes that are siblings, basically children of the same parents, uh, that the parent has kind of set up this communication between them. Uh, there's a sort of variation. called a named pipe, which is uh, actually what the OSV test.py uses. Uh, it creates these named pipe files, which are a way to have basically location, uh, uh, pretend files uh, in the file system where one process can write to the file, but it's just this sort of uh, a name for this in-memory buffer that processes can read and write from. Oh. How, do, how does the stuff that's running this, how does the consumer know it's, it can start reading from it, and how does the uh, uh, kernel know to, like, okay, it's time to start the consumer and all that stuff? Uh, so you could design reading from a pipe in as, uh, you might think of it as blocking or non-blocking. So in one version, the consumer calls read, and that function never returns until there's something to read. The other is it calls read and read returns, and, and, and if there's nothing to read, read returns immediately with some return value or some other way of communicating that there was nothing to read. And uh, you could even have a version that did both. But if the producer is writing things like not instantaneously, like if the entire thing is just immediately filled with stuff, then you could end up with something where the consumer only processes the first half of it, right? You mean the producer like fills this up and then? Yeah. Well, like, if, it, if it's only filled up, like maybe it's just writing something, you know, and uh, if it only writes the first half of it uh, and before, and then read it, it gets called, and it means like, okay, this is the entire thing, uh, even though the producer is still like in progress of finishing filling up the pipe. Uh, yeah. So for whatever application this is, um, the consumer would need to. Uh, read until it sees something that tells it that there's nothing more to read, okay. or it knows, like, I need to read this sort of so data structure, the so I know, I know how many bytes I need to read. Um, or the consumer is doing something like, just reading forever as long as this pipe is open and doing something with the bytes that we read. Okay. okay. What, what if you have, like, four processes, and you know, 
each one pair wants to communicate with each other and the other pair wants to communicate with them like that pair? Like, do you just make a second pipe or do you still share pipes? Or? Uh, so any two processes that want to communicate, you'd create a pipe to facilitate communication between them. Uh, if you need uh, like a, a two-way communication, so this is one direction, right? One process writes, the other reads. Uh, if we want two-way a network socket, which on uh, Unix is going to be treated the exact same way as a file. It's going to have a file descriptor. Um, uh, and it will facilitate two-way communication. And if two processes are on the same system, are communicating using a socket, the operating system will actually optimize that instead of actually using the full kind of network protocol. So we're starting to submit problems, right? Uh, this array, you mean? Yeah. Yes. So what if you really hate this? Uh, so that's a good point. Uh, if this producer could just do whatever it wants with some chunk of kernel memory, that would be bad. Uh, but this read and write will be done through system calls. So in order, so we again have this sort of narrow interface by which the processes can, can interact with some kernel structure. They can't just, it's not like this producer just has a memory address and uh, does whatever it wants. This pipe will be a file descriptor, and the uh, producer and consumer will read and write from this file descriptor like they would any others. Just instead of a file, it's this this pipe buffer. Here, can they be invisible? Uh, the like with this idea of uh, a pipe specifically is just kind of one process on either end. Uh, but you could create, say, some sort of queue data structure uh, and have processes and have multiple producers and consumers inserting or, or removing from uh, a shared queue. So that would not work with processes. For that, you require shared memory. So if you're getting into a situation, multiple producers, multiple consumers, you're starting to get where you kind of need shared memory and using processes is maybe not the best way to go. All right. So let's uh, uh, transition to uh, out of our uh, cave of, of isolated uh, non-shared memory into uh, the glorious sunlight uh, and uh, terrifying power of shared memory. Um, but before we do that, there is an important word from our sponsor today, President Millard Fillmore. <laughs> so, you may remember, Zachary Taylor dies uh, after uh, a year and a half in office as Vice President uh, uh, Millard uh, takes up the presidency, and uh, unlike Taylor, uh, uh, Millard Fillmore supported the sort of compromise of the day uh, on the issue of slavery. That there were threats of, of secession, there was tremendous argument about whether uh, uh, all this territory that the country just acquired from Mexico, whether slavery would be allowed there. And uh, uh, our good friend Henry Clay, uh, along with some others in Congress, came up with the Compromise of 1850, uh, which uh, under, under Fillmore, the, the White House uh, supported and managed to get, get through. Uh, and so what that did is uh, 
took the U.S. from this situation to this one, where California was admitted as a uh, free state. Uh, there would be so-called popular sovereignty for the territories where the people that lived there would vote on whether slavery would be allowed. Uh, the fugitive slave law was strengthened, which was uh, deeply unpopular in the North. And uh, this was probably the most uh, violent time in Congress. There were fist fights and guns drawn uh, during the debate on this. Um, also during this time, uh, Miller Fillmore deterred uh, France under Emperor Napoleon III from annexing Hawaii. Um, uh, Southerners wanted the U.S. to annex Cuba, so there would be uh, more slave territory. Uh, and there were several private military expeditions to Cuba by Americans to try and overthrow the Spanish government that all failed. And Miller Fillmore tried to get the Whig nomination in uh, 1852, but he lost to old fuss and feathers, uh, General Winfield Scott, again going with a uh, well-known military hero, but Winfield Scott would, would not become president. And uh, then four years later, Millard Fillmore would run as the candidate of the Know Nothing Party, which was uh, essentially an uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic uh, party uh, that was uh, pretty... Uh, uh, it was an influential force uh, kind of in, in pre-Civil War uh, U.S. All right, now that's enough of that. So, the world that we have been looking at has been one where we have user processes, and the way that, and, and one potential design, and in fact, the, the way that OSV uh, approaches it, is that each of these processes has underlying it a kernel thread, meaning a, uh, a thread of execution uh, uh, that is man created and managed by the kernel. And then each of these processes has just a single thread, but OSV <coughs> is managing and scheduling a set of threads uh, on one or more CPUs. And so we've been mainly thinking this world of user processes, the memory is isolated. Uh, but once we have threads, once we, uh, and these kernel threads or, or others, we're in a situation where these threads might be interacting with the same memory, the same kernel data structure. For example, if one of these processes calls fork, that needs to create a new process and, for example, might need to add an entry to some global list of all processes. And if we have two processes that are calling fork at the same time, both trying to change this uh, list of all the processes, then we run into trouble because they could potentially interfere with each other. And so out of this existence of multiple threads, We have to think about, well, they might simultaneously try and modify some shared data. And if they're simultaneously modifying
shared data, we're going to need some way of protecting it. So why is modifying uh, uh, shared data, why can this get us into trouble? I know some of you have, have uh, uh, encountered this example before, uh, but let's consider the situation uh, where you and your roommate uh, like to keep milk in the fridge and there's no milk. And if we have roommate one and roommate two, uh, roommate one may look at the fridge, see there's no milk, leave for the store, at which point roommate two Look at the looks at the fridge, sees there's no milk. And leaves for the store. Roommate one has acquired the milk, returns with the milk. Roommate two returns with the milk, and disaster is struck. <laughs> we have too much milk. The fridge, it's, it's overflowing. Disaster. Um, and so what we would like to achieve is safety and liveness. There are two properties that we want. Uh, we want to get out of this situation. Safety I mean, there should never be more than one milk. Safety means we have some constraint. We have uh, some something, some invariant. We don't want too much milk. Safety says, okay, our solution to this guarantees that we're never going to have too much milk. Liveness says, if we don't have milk, Eventually, someone will get more milk. So we, for, we could achieve safety by no one ever buys milk. Then we're guaranteed to never have too much of it, but then we wouldn't have this liveness where if we're out, eventually we're going to get some more milk. So, might attempt different strategies to. Uh, uh, solve our, our milk situation. One might be uh, whoever goes to buy milk needs to leave a note. Something like if milk is zero, if there is no note, leave a note acquire more milk. Is this going to give us, is this going to meet our, our requirements for, for safety uh, and, and liveness? Yeah. Yes, that we have this issue with safety because one roommate could check for the milk and then they get context switched out, and the other roommate checks for the milk. Uh, and so both roommates could be thinking that there is no milk and no note, and then both proceed to leave a note and get more milk. So. And, and this doesn't work, kind of, but can you also just set, what if you set milk to negative one, you know? So that, and then you could do, you could perform your, I guess you'd have the same issue, never mind. Uh, 
So we're in this situation where we have these, these shared variables, uh, but it's possible for one roommate or, or thread to check the value of some variable, but then for the state of the system to change in between when it checks the variable and when it actually acts upon the result. Victor? Could we use some kind of a system call to make sure we're not interrupted in the middle of leaving the note? Uh, yes. So if before we do this, we turn interrupts off, basically says no one else uh, can do anything in the kitchen until we're finished with this process. Uh, that as long as we didn't lock down the kitchen for very long, that might uh, that might be okay. Uh, and here the metaphor breaks down a little bit, but for turning interrupts off, this is a per processor operation. So if one thread turns interrupts off and is like, okay, no one's going to interrupt me. Another thread being run on some other CPU could still be doing stuff. Uh, but if we have just one processor turning interrupts off, uh, can be helpful. Can we use the pipe thing we were talking about earlier? Uh, so we will make use of shared memory. Uh, but we, because now we're in this uh, world of threads where they can access each other's memory, we don't actually we don't necessarily need the whole kind of infrastructure of, of a pipe to, to coordinate communication. So uh, let me just show you an alternative solution. Uh, in this case. Uh, we're going to have the roommates use slightly different programs where they kind of have different notes that they set. And they make sure the other roommate has not left their note before they proceed to uh, do the same. Uh, if, if there's no milk, add, uh, acquire more milk, and then sort of remove the note when they're done. Is this going to give us safety and or liveness? So? If note A switches to one, and then it switches to the other thread, and note B switches to one, they both, nothing happens. Yes, exactly. This has, this actually will give us safety, because one of these two Roommates will, if they're both trying to set the note, one of them is going to go first, and that will prevent the other one from getting them. But, as I pointed out, we don't have liveness. They could both leave a note, and then like, oh, the other one's getting them. And they just, no note is, is ever acquired. And so, uh, next time we will pick up with how we actually. Uh, solve these roommates' uh, terrible milk dilemma. Uh, in the meantime, uh, please uh, take a look at uh, the Lab 2 write-up uh, and uh, the reading and notes for today. Uh, I have office hours this afternoon, 4.30, and I'll see you on Wednesday. Oh.